Is Sony gonna drop a PS4 Super Slim? How's it going guys? And welcome to PS Ready, the channel all about PlayStation. And before I jump into it all, I wanna let you guys know that this video is sponsored by me. Yes, I have so many links down in my description for any PS5 accessory you might need. In today's video, we're going to talk about this news story that just came out where Sony has revealed during an investor call that they plan on abandoning the PS4 in 2025. Now, honestly, that's a little bit later than I would like or than I was expecting but then I sat down and thought about it for a second and to me the only reason they'd be supporting it that long doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to see games like Uncharted 5 or The Last of Us Part 3 also have PlayStation 4 versions they're just keeping it around long enough to support games like MLB The Show, NBA 2K, Madden you know all these sports games that come out every year and when they can't be released on these older consoles anymore there's usually a legacy edition like what we see on the Switch specifically with FIFA that was like the most embarrassing release in terms of sports games. They basically took a last gen version of FIFA, ported it over to the Switch, and then every year they make zero improvements to it. They call it the Legacy Edition, and they just do roster updates and charge people $60 for it. That's the kind of game that I think will be keeping the PS4 alive until 2025. That and online games like Fortnite, which are still supported by the PS4 and PS4 Pro. I'm assuming that once Fortnite moves over to Unreal Engine 5 and starts getting some crazier visual effects, Effects, they'll start abandoning or at least closing down that version of the game just because you can log into your Fortnite account pretty much anywhere you want and keep all of your stuff, even the PS5. So when that player base of Fortnite on PS4 starts to dwindle and dwindle even more, that's when they'll start sunsetting the device, which would probably line up with this 2025 date. But in the meantime, it's only 2022 and we're only halfway through 2022. So why hasn't Sony released a PS4 Super Slim? The Super Slim is kind of something that's been around pretty much since the beginning of PlayStation devices. We had the PlayStation 1, right? The big fat version that had the top loading disc drive. It was a pretty cool iconic design. Then we got the super, super slim version of it, which was the PS1, like P-S-O-N-E. And it had that cool flip up screen. It was a really cool revision of the device. Then the PS2 came out and we got the PS2 fat launch model that had the really cool rainbow PS2, and then we got the slim model. So those generations only had two different versions of the consoles, right? You had the PlayStation 1, and then the PS1, then the PS2, and the PS2 slim. The slim model usually came out towards the end of that generation when the new console was coming out because it was a cheaper option that used the same parts. So people who didn't wanna buy new games full price or pick up a new console could go into the backlog and buy all of the platinum hits or greatest hits, whatever PlayStation called it back in the day. Those style of games that were traditionally sold for like $20 or ended up being five bucks used at GameStop. You could really, if you stayed a generation behind, be a lot cheaper as a gamer than you can now when everything is online and consoles like the PS3 get abandoned by Sony, just out of the blue, randomly. We also saw this with handhelds, but the PSP had many different revisions. There were like multiple versions of the original PSP. So of course in 2004, we had the original PSP, the PSP 1000. My grandpa took me to the mall and got it for me with Tony Hawk's Underground 2 Remix, which was like the definitive version of that game. I played so many hours of that. And then the second game I got for it was Star Wars Battlefront 2. Good times gaming with that PSP 1000. Then there was the PSP 2000 in 2007, followed by the PSP 3000 in 2008. That's when you started to see a lot of special editions. I remember the God of War one was awesome. When Battlefront Renegade Squadron came out, they did a really cool Darth Vader edition that I really, really wanted. Never had that one. The biggest difference with that version of the console though was that instead of 32 megabytes of RAM, yes, you heard me right, 32 megabytes, that one had 64 megabytes, which is still insane that that was a console that had 64 megabytes of RAM. I mean, the PS5 right now has 16 gigabytes of RAM, which if you look at the PC side of things, that's still considered pretty low. 32 gigabytes is basically the standard for a lot of PCs now. So to imagine that the PSP 2000 was like a huge upgrade with 64 megabytes of RAM back in 2008, it's kind of weird to think about. Then in 2009, we got the most ahead of its time console ever, the PSP Go. Now this was the second PSP I got. I missed the 2000 and 3000. This was a slide up PSP. It had a really cool like shimmery, sparkly white finish. And the difference between the original and this one was that this one supported digital games only. There was no UMD slot on this device and it was very pocket sized. I remember during Driver's Ed, I used to play Crash Bandicoot 3 Warped on this thing in the back of the room all the time. And I still managed to get my 
driver's license. The only issue that cropped up with it being a digital only console at that time was weird licensing issues. Two of the best games on the PSP were never available on the PSP Go. One of them being Crisis Core Final Fantasy VII and the other one being Kingdom Hearts Birth by Sleep. I wanted to play these games so bad and I didn't have my original PSP anymore and I could never play them on this device or even the PlayStation Vita because they were never made available on the PlayStation Store. The cool thing was though that it did support PlayStation 1 classics. I mentioned that I played Crash Bandicoot 3 Warped. This was also my first experience with a Metal Gear Solid game. The original game worked really well on it. It was a really cool device, again, really ahead of its time. It was a cool music player as well, but it didn't really catch on because it was a little too expensive and Wi-Fi at the time just wasn't ubiquitous enough or good enough for people to really buy into a digital only device. And then the final revision was the like budget, I guess super, super slim model, the PSP Street, the E1000. This was the cheapest option you ever had to get a PSP, but much like the last revision of the Wii, it would be a stupid thing to buy because it had no Wi-Fi chip in it. So you could not connect to the internet. Now, if you're sitting there thinking, how did you upgrade the software on this device or the firmware if you couldn't connect to the internet? Well, back in the day when you would buy a PSP game, it came on those sweet little UMDs and you would pop them in your PSP. And then sometimes if they needed a newer version of PSP firmware than the one the PSP usually shipped with, it would be on that UMD and you could upgrade it from the game. So you would basically have to go online, figure out what the latest version of the PSP software was, and then find a game that had it included with it and install it that way. I'm pretty sure that since this was the last PSP though, it kind of got the last important software update with it. It's just crazy to think that you had really no access to the PlayStation network at all or the PlayStation store. You had a device that could play games and that's pretty much it. It's kind of cool and it is a matte black device that I think looks pretty sweet, but yeah, I don't think this one landed as well as Sony wanted it to. And then with the PS Vita, things kind of went back to how they worked on the PS1 and PS2, where you had the PS Vita launch unit, which had the OLED screen. And then a few years later, they did the LCD screen version, which honestly, I think not only looks better than the original version, it was also more ergonomic to the point where I think it was probably worth the upgrade if you kept your original Vita, right? Because now that OLED Vita is super valuable and the LCD ones are pretty valuable, just not by much. By that point though, even though it had a huge price reduction versus the original PS Vita, and it came along with Borderlands 2 as a downloadable game. People were just kind of over the Vita, thanks in part to Sony making you use proprietary memory cards that they massively overcharged for. I remember the 64 gigabyte cards for that device being around $100, which at the time I was in college and I bought a handheld system because games were cheaper. They were around 40 bucks. And then I went to the store and realized I had to buy this expensive ass memory card to even play the games I wanted to play. It was not a great system at all. And then concurrently with that, we had the PS3 generation, which really shook things up because there are many, many revisions of the PS3, kind of like the PSP. So you had the original launch PS3, which was 600 bucks. It had a bunch of features no one wanted, like SD card readers on it. It could connect to printers. You could basically use it as a computer if you wanted to install Linux on it. Sony quickly realized that no one was shelling out 600 bucks for that console, especially since it launched with so few games since it was so hard to develop for. So they went back to the drawing board. They released a fat version of the console that looked almost identical, but it didn't have Chrome. It was a more muted silver accented device. And also it didn't have all of these unnecessary extra ports. And the biggest thing they took out was the full PS2 that launched with the original PS3. Yeah, so to emulate PS2 games on the original device, they had PS2 parts inside the PS3. And when they took that out, you lost PS2 emulation, which came later through digital downloads. But yeah, it was a big thing to take out of the device. But considering it was massively overpriced at 600 bucks, I can see why they did it. And after that price cut and the release of huge games like Infamous, Infamous 2, Uncharted 2, even Uncharted 3, uh, Resistance 2, Resistance 3, uh, Metal Gear Solid 4, SOCOM 4, there were a ton of great games that came out after the first fat PS3's revision. And then we got the slim model and that's where I think the PS3 really took off. But then later on, towards the end of the PS3's life cycle in 2012, just a year before the PS4 came out, we got the PS3 Super Slim. And this thing, just like the PSP Street, was a huge miss from Sony, in my opinion. It stripped out a lot of the features. It felt and looked really cheap. It kind of had the vibe of like a weird CD player. And the way you put discs into this thing was by sliding back the top of the device and it would just have the disc drive exposed sitting there. 
and you could just put the game in, you'd be good to go. It's the last remnant of the PS3 generation we have, and it shipped with a very small hard drive compared to what we got in the PS3 Slim. Sony, it seems like, was ready to leave that generation behind, but they just wanted a cheaper version out there, like what we had with the PS2 Slim. But yeah, PS4 generation, we got the PS4 launch model, and it looked pretty cool. It had this like slanted design. The biggest issue with it was it had a kind of like glossy top half of plastic that you could pop off. It scratched so easy. You could just breathe on this thing and it would scratch like gnarly, like the back of the original iPod video. It was like that level of scratchy. So then they released the PS4 Slim, which looked pretty good, I wanna say. It was like a flatter, matte, still slanted design. It had that stacked look. I think it looked a little cheap though, just because of how rough the plastic was. It didn't really look like a premium device. And then the PS4 Pro was arguably worse because it was the same design as the PS4 Slim, but if you just added another stack to it. So it was like a triple stacked version of the PS4 Slim. Not the best design, but we never got anything after that, right? Like Sony's released a bunch of special editions, special edition PS4 Pros, but we never got that PS4 Slim. And I feel like we're gonna see one at some point just because Sony has invested so heavily in the PS4 over the past few years. Just knowing how hard it is to get a PS5, I feel like the time is now, I think, for Sony to do a revision that's smaller, comes with the two terabyte hard drive, but largely has all the same features as the PS4 Slim. Maybe they could also do a slimmer version of the PS4 Pro, but just like with Xbox, I don't think that's going to happen because they don't want to give you a powerful device that's anywhere close to what you could run on the PS5. One reason I think we might not see a Super Slim is because Sony is so focused on the PS5 and they've got to be also focused on the PS5 Pro, which they're definitely going to do just because the PS4 Pro was so profitable for them. And also as the console generations move on, it takes less and less silicon to make the chips that are inside of them. And with the silicon shortage happening in the world right now, making PS4s is probably pretty costly, even compared to making a newer device like the PS5. The other parts inside the PS4 get cheaper over time, but the one thing that stays pretty constant is the chip inside. But if they did end up releasing a PS4 Super Slim and they could hit like a price point of $200, maybe even $150, that device suddenly becomes a competitor to the Xbox Series S, which even though it sells for around $250 regularly on sale, getting something like that for $200 or even $150, even though it runs games noticeably worse than the Series S, I think it would be kind of a moment where people can pick and choose between these two consoles because again, people prefer PlayStation at this point, which is kind of crazy, right? Like I would always take the more powerful console, which would be the Xbox Series S, but people like PlayStation and they wanna play their PlayStation games. If they do release a PS4 Super Slim and you end up buying it, you're gonna have a great library of stuff to play on it though, because some of the best games of all time were released during the PS4 generation. But if you do get a PS5, you're gonna run them a whole lot better at 60 frames per second. 